Okay, this is Unit 1, Lecture 1 for History 1483, U.S. History up to 1865. Um, this lecture, we're going to be covering the First Nations. We're not really going to get into colonization so much. That's more for the next lecture. Uh, but we are going to talk about kind of that first contact and what both groups of people thought of each other, which was usually not much. It seems like way too often we start the history of the United States at 1607, when Jamestown was founded, or the history of the Americas at 1492, the point of first contact. And honestly, in a regular semester, when you got to cover uh, North American history from the first human arrival to 1865, and you only got 15 or 16 weeks to do it in, that's a problem. But one of the reasons why I don't like to skip over the First Nations is because that's kind of taking the Americans out of American history. Now, the first colonists, the European settlers, they didn't think of themselves as Americans. And to be honest, neither did the indigenous people. Uh, the idea of Native Americans, of Indians, was something that really came with the Europeans, uh, who didn't see the differences between people. But Europeans didn't think of themselves as Americans. They didn't think of themselves even as New Worlders. They didn't have any real connection to the land. Many of them were not intending to stay here. They came looking for wealth. When they got it, they were going to go back home. So they stayed English, or French, or Dutch, or Russian, or Spanish. Um, in fact, it took about 115 years after first contact for the English to even start a permanent colony. And those colonists didn't start thinking of themselves as Americans until just a few years before the Revolution. And the other problem with skipping over these early years, these early millennia, I guess is better, is you get the impression that not much happened here before 1607 or 1492 or whatever year you pick. And that makes it easy to forget that a lot of European colonial survival is owed to the natives. A lot of modern U.S. history is owed to the natives, the fact that there is a modern U.S. Like the Mayflower Company. They survived their first winter in the New World by stealing stockpiled corn from the local Wampanoags. And then, of course, in the spring, they were given seed corn, and they were shown how to plant it, mostly so they would stop stealing. And the reason that the Plymouth Company survived, the reason the Pilgrims survived, was that initial cooperation on, and really even that dependence on the native peoples. England had tried to found other northern colonies before, but none of them had survived. And, of course, a lot of the founding fathers of the nation were influenced by Native Americans. John Adams, uh, second president of the United States, one of the fathers of the Revolution, uh, he was heavily influenced by the separation of powers that he found in the uh, Iroquois Confederacy, looking at their laws, looking at how they governed. Thomas Jefferson, when he was a little boy, his father uh, would take him out to meet with Cherokee leaders. And as a grown man, he continued to do that. Uh, and he encouraged James Madison and James Monroe and, and other political leaders to talk to Indian nations, especially the ones that were considered civilized. The Cherokee were one of the five civilized tribes to see what they did, how they governed. Now, I shouldn't have to say this in a class in Ottawa County, Oklahoma, but it is worth saying, so I will say it. The nations that we are talking about the nations that we're going to study, for the most part, are not things of the past. Now, you get out of Oklahoma, you get out of places where they have uh, a lot of Native communities, and, and you run into that problem. You run into people who kind of think that there just aren't any more Indians, there aren't any more Native Americans, they're all gone. You know, if you're an Indian, why are you wearing jeans and not buckskin? Uh, but in Oklahoma, we shouldn't have that problem, right? Um, the Native American population, of course, was devastated, not just at first contact, but continuing for centuries. But in the last oh, 50, 60 years or so, we've started to grow again. We've regained 
the right to speak our language, to pass it on, to teach it to our children. So these cultures, when we're talking about them, don't think about them as being relics of the past, because in many cases they're not. Now we're going to have to do some generalizations because of the time frame that we have to work with here. But there was so much diversity in North America before European contact. There were actually more nations, more civilizations, more ethnic groups, more languages in North America than there were in Europe at the same time. So it can be a little problematic to make those generalizations. Um, now there were some philosophies and there were some beliefs that tended to be shared between groups, uh, especially those that lived in kind of the same region. Uh, there were some aspects of life that tended to hold true, where we come across some interesting deviations from the norm. I'll try and stop and talk about them, because you can learn actually a lot about their neighbors by how this one group was kind of unusual. And we're going to talk about what we know, what we think we know, and what we know and what we think we know changes very rapidly. History isn't static. What we know about the past changes all the time. Um, what we know and what we think we know has changed actually very recently uh, about early North America. For one thing, most of the nations of North America, of what is now the United States and Canada, um, excluding Mexico, did not have a writing system. Now, some of the nations in Mexico itself, which is also a part of North America, did. Like the Aztecs, uh, more properly called the Mexica, they did have a writing system. But up here, we didn't. And even when you were studying a literate society, even when you got written down records, uh, you got contracts, and treaties, and laws, and these things to study, sometimes the information you get isn't complete or it's wrong, or sometimes it's actually a lie. One of my favorite examples of this is from Egyptian history. Um, a couple thousand years ago, 3,000-ish years ago, uh, there was a war between Egypt and the Hittite Empire. And all we knew about that war was from the Egyptian sources. And the Egyptian sources said, roughly, we defeated them mightily by the hands of the gods. And then we gave them all of this land because we're such nice guys. Well, that's kind of suspicious on the face of it. You might not believe that. And why would they be so nice? But we didn't have any written documents contradicting it. And obviously nobody's around that remembers it. And then about a decade ago, really not very long ago at all, archaeologists found an archive with Hittite documents in it. Their version of the story, and in fact they had the peace treaty there, shows that Egypt was on the verge of losing its butt before they gave in and gave up this land. I think that was actually Ramses II, who was the pharaoh of Egypt at the time. He is kind of known for over-exaggerating his military prowess. So what do you do when you don't have any written records? Well, the first thing is you listen. Pre-literate societies depend on their oral tradition, their stories, to pass down their history, uh, their religion, their culture, their laws, their everything that's important. Uh, the Indian nations of today, we can look at them. The Inyo campus is situated in Ottawa County, the land of the nine tribes. Nine nations have their headquarters here, and they've all got a strong sense of their own history. Unfortunately, of course, some native groups were destroyed before anybody had a chance to hear their stories and write down what they had to say. Uh, and, of course, many Europeans just weren't that interested in writing down the, the histories of the people that they were enslaving or shipping back to Europe or what have you. Some of them were, though. Spanish priests uh, actually were often very good about writing down uh, the histories, the stories of the people they came across. Not because they believed them, not because they took it seriously, uh, because that's just what you do. And of course, there were some nations that rose and fell before they ever ran into anybody who could write, and they left behind nothing but physical remains. Some of those are huge monuments, like the city of Cahokia, like the mounds at Watson Brake. Some it's, sometimes it's just a village site, sometimes it's just their bones. Now that's archaeology. 
archaeology is the study of physical objects. Your tools, your clothes, your human remains. That's how people speak to us from hundreds or thousands of years ago. Tell us how they lived, how they died. If we get really lucky, they can tell us a little bit about how they lived and what was important to them. Uh, we usually, when we're that lucky, usually when we get to find out what mattered to them, we kind of rediscover over and over that people are not that different thousands of years apart. That what's important to people tends to hold true no matter how much time has passed. Now when I was in high school, we learned that North America had only been inhabited for about 12,000 years. Because we didn't have evidence of stone tools older than that. Then a few years back, no more than 15 years ago, people started uncovering preserved wooden tools that suggested that people had been here for quite a while before we'd ever thought. Recent DNA testing over just the last five or six years shows that genetic differences started cropping up between 20 and 30,000 years ago. What are we going to uncover tomorrow? I have no idea, but I'm very excited about it. So let's start with what we have proof of. Tens of thousands of years ago, there was an ice age. The Earth was a lot colder. The northern seas froze over. And one of the places that this happened was a narrow strip of ocean between what is now Alaska and Siberia. And it's called the Bering Strait today. Uh, you can stand on one side of it and, and see the land on the other side. It's that narrow. And during the Ice Age, uh, the glaciers came down and they covered this land and the seas rose. Uh, the ice covered it and you could walk across it. It became the Bering Land Bridge, sometimes called Beringia. We know that big game animals, like mammoths, walked across this bridge. They were looking for fresh food, they were looking uh, for a better source, and so they came across the land bridge. It took them, obviously, hundreds of thousands of years. It wasn't one mammoth making the whole trek down to South America. And groups of people followed them. Not just one group of people, but hundreds of different groups of people over thousands of years. Um, we base this idea, we base the idea that it was lots of different groups of people on language, actually. Native American languages in North America bear similarities to different Asian languages. Like the Nadine family of languages, it's spoken out in Western Canada, up in Alaska, very, very similar to the Anesian language family that's still spoken in central Siberia. And when the Ice Age ended, when the, the late glacial maximum ended, about 12,000 years ago, the seas rose, Beringia melted, it became the Bering Strait that we know today, and the Americas were permanently separated from the rest of the world, more or less. There are some stories of people crossing back and forth, especially out on the Pacific coast. We have minimal proof of that. But you know, a lot of times, the stories that we hear from Native people turn out to be factually based. So that might actually be true as well. Uh, the early hunters and their descendants, they spread across North and South America. They uh, reached the tip of South America 11, 12, 13-ish thousand years ago. That's what we know. But it's not what we think we might find out. Just actually in 2013. There have been some archaeological discoveries that suggest maybe people were at the very southern part of South America longer than we have known so far. Now, as the climate warmed up, as the Ice Age ended, these people faced a food crisis. Just like people in Asia and Europe and Africa, everybody was facing this food crisis. The big game animals were dying off because their food source was dying off because the climate had changed. So they can't eat these plants that they're used to eating, which means you can't hunt them, which means, what the heck do you do? About 9,000 years ago, different groups of people kind of spontaneously, uh, completely separately, uh, separate from each other, just developed the concept of agriculture. It happened at about the same time in central Mexico, which had no contact with the Near East in what is now Iraq which had no contact with China, and yet all of these people were developing agriculture at about the same time. As that technology spread, 
It allowed people to develop settled civilizations, towns and villages, and sometimes even cities. Now, some nations were able to build permanent settlements in very large cities. Like in what is now the United States, the biggest city was Cahokia, with about 10,000 people. <laughs> As you go down to Mexico, uh, toward, toward the Az Aztec Empire, their capital was closer to 200,000 people. Now, you might wonder why North America, uh, what is now the United States and Canada, and actually most of Mexico outside of the Aztec Empire, why we didn't become a fully urban society. Why didn't we become a fully agricultural, settled society? Why were there still so, so many nomadic and semi-nomadic people around at the time of first contact, when the Europeans had been living in cities for, you know, a, a good 1,500, couple thousand years? Uh, they'd been living in cities in Africa and Asia even longer than that. Well, the answer is kind of a quirk of geography. You want to live in a city. That means you're going to have people there who don't farm. You're going to have your politicians, uh, you're going to have priests, you're going to have manufacturers, you're going to have all of these people who need somebody else to feed them. Which means that the farmers are going to have to be able to grow a lot more food. And we didn't have the capacity to do that in this hemisphere, especially not in North America. To grow that much food, you need domesticated animals. We had dogs up here. Not even big dogs, not like Great Danes, but little collie-sized dogs. Can't really strap a plow to them and expect them to do much work for you. Uh, down in South America, they did have llamas. So they could do a little more agriculture, a little more widespread farming than we could do up here. Uh, but we didn't have it. In Europe, of course, they had oxen, they had cattle, they had horses, they had all sorts of things. You can strap a plow to those. They're big and strong. They can help you farm a lot more, which means you have a bigger surplus, which means you can feed more people. We didn't have that. For lack of a native cow, uh, North America remained largely rural. In those places that did become rather large cities, like Cahokia, like Tenochtitlan, they relied very heavily on their neighbors, sometimes using force uh, to make sure that their neighbors would provide enough food. That was certainly the Aztec way. In the beginning, development between the old world and the new world really kept pace with each other. Developed agriculture at about the same time. Uh, Native North Americans were building monuments, actually uh, a little bit before uh, they were doing so in the old world. The mounds at Watson Break in Louisiana are older than the oldest pyramids. They're about 5,400 years old. As civilizations rose and fell because of war or famine or climate change or what have you. In the Southwest, the ancestors of today's Hopi and Zuni and Navajo peoples started settling into villages about 3,000 years ago, which is about the same time that the, the great kingdoms of the Near East were forming as well. Uh, the Southwestern people eventually learned how to build quite large, reasonably large, three to 4,000 people, centrally planned towns with multi-family housing. It was like apartment buildings. Like this is a picture of Chaco Canyon, which you can still visit today. And those aren't ant hills. Right? These are apartment buildings that people lived in. That glare's a little too bad. Uh, and down here as well. They're more broken up down here better condition up there. But these are two and three story apartment buildings. You'd get in it, you'd climb up a ladder on the outside, and then you'd come in through the roof and you'd climb down ladders on the inside. So they were very easily defensible. If somebody comes along and you don't want them in your house, you pull up the ladder, they don't get to get in. You can also visit Acoma Pueblo, which looks very similar to this as well. Acoma Pueblo is the oldest continually occupied city uh, in the United States. Uh, along the Rio Grande, which is now our southern border with Mexico, uh, southwestern natives perfected the techniques of desert farming. Not much water, so what are you going to do? Uh, they brought in irrigation systems to water their corn and their beans and their cotton. They also specifically bred strains of corn to be drought resistant. 
Farther west, where it was even drier, they practiced what is known as dry farming, which if you're an Aggie student, you know this is once again becoming uh, a very cool thing to do. It's, it's one of those new green kind of uh, agricultural technologies. You don't use irrigation. You don't bring in a system in dry farming. What you do is you find a dry riverbed, uh, a wash, an arroyo, the place where the snow melt runs, and you plant there. Then when the flood days come, or the snow melts off the mountain, then your plants get the water they need and you don't have to bring any in. Among the people of the southwest, typically the men would farm, uh, the women would gather wild fruits. Now, the governments of the southwest varied quite a bit. In the big towns, places like uh, Chaco, places like Acoma, um, they tended to have town councils. They would elect officials. Often, if they were very big, they would have sort of like a mayor. Uh, one person who was in charge of kind of directing the council, and then they would have the council that was specialized. And one person in charge of the planting, making sure you're planting in the right places. One person making sure that uh, every family has fresh water. Further west, uh, as you get into smaller towns, it tended to be much more loosely organized. In general, the bigger the town you had, the more structured government you had. The smaller your town was, the smaller your settlement was, the more you were likely to just get all the men together and talk it out, which is what happened in, in most of the small settlements of the southwest. The Apache, though, the Apache especially that lived in the mountains, were a little different. They governed by consensus, but not just of the men. The women of the Apache villages also had a voice. That was unusual in that particular area. Now, the Apache were also different from their western neighbors because they were matrilineal, which means they traced descent through the mother and not the father. And they were matrilocal, which means that when a young woman married, her new husband would come to live in her mother's home, rather than her going to live with his family. And more than a thousand years before Columbus ever sailed, the Indians of the Ohio and the Mississippi River Valleys uh, were trading across half the continent. These people are known today as mound builders because they built gigantic ceremonial mounds, sometimes burial mounds and sometimes just places to have big ceremonies. Places like Chillicothe, Ohio. After these nations declined, uh, their descendants flourished, especially in the Mississippi Valley. They were centered kind of on the city of Cahokia, which is just east of St. Louis today. It's actually just outside of East St. Louis. This is a, an artist's rendering of what Cahokia might have looked like when it was at its peak. We have the ruins of the city, but of course things like the thatch roofs wouldn't have survived. By the year 1000, Cahokia had a larger population than London, England did at that time, uh, more than 10,000 people. Cahokia was at the center of a massive trade network. Uh, they traded with people on the Atlantic coast. They traded with people in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, on occasion, all the way down into central Mexico. Uh, in fact, we even found obsidian from out in what is now Yellowstone area, which is a long way to travel when you're walking. They had industry. They mined. Uh, they mined salt. They traded for other goods like chert. Uh, copper. They even had a small industry that manufactured stone farming tools. And they were able to build that population by leaning heavily on their neighbors um, with promises of favors and also sometimes threats uh, to make sure that they were fed. Other groups that were kind of connected to this civilization included the Natchez, which is a really unusual society for that area and that period of time. The Natchez, uh, down in, shockingly, what is now kind of Mississippi and Louisiana, um, they had one of the most highly developed religious hierarchies of the pre-Columbian era. The Natchez had a theocracy. A theocracy means that their religious establishment, 
runs the government. The high priest is the head of state, and there's no separation whatsoever. Uh, they had a very highly stratified society. There was the priestly caste at the top, there was the warrior caste, and then there was kind of the peasant caste underneath. Uh, they had much more in common with the Aztecs down in central Mexico than they had with their own neighbors. Of course, looking through the material remains that they left behind, uh, they traded a great deal with the Aztecs, rather more than they did with their own neighbors. And that's probably why their societies were so very similar. Now, farther east, closer to the coast, hundreds of tribes built towns and villages scattered from Canada down to the Gulf of Mexico. Most of the eastern United States was either settled or semi-settled. Uh, they lived basically on corn and squash and beans. Uh, usually the women would farm and the men would hunt deer and turkey and some other wild game. Their trade routes crisscrossed the eastern part of the continent. They fought a lot over who had the right to hunt here, who's got the right to trade with this group. It started to get very chaotic uh, and, and quite unsettled. So in about the early 1400s, late 1300s, early 1400s, we started seeing various leagues and confederations and alliances springing up between these different people to try and stabilize this situation. Can't be going to war every year, because then you don't have time to do anything else. Down in the southeast, the Choctaw, Cherokee, Chickasaw, and Creek each united dozens of towns in loose alliances. Each of those nations kind of brought something to the table that their new allies could benefit from. Uh, like the Creeks. Uh, they had a lot of diplomats, actually. They were known to have ambassadors in, in nations as far away as the Ohio Valley or the North Ohio Valley, um, all the way out into the plains in some cases which meant that the people who were allied with them got to benefit from those connections. Uh, the Choctaws had a remarkably extensive trade system that their allies benefited from. Up in the northeast, in what is now New York State, five Iroquoian nations, the Mohawk, the Oneida, the Seneca and Cayuga, and Onondaga, people we've heard of around here, they formed the Great League of Peace, what today we call the, the Iroquois Confederacy, and that helped to stabilize the North. Each of those five nations individually was very powerful. Um, the neighbors of these five nations uh, pretty much knew fairly often one or the other is going to come stomping over them. And sometimes it would be multiple times a year because you got five very powerful groups of people that are trying to prove that they are the big kids on the block. So it was actually a benefit to those smaller, weaker nations when the Confederacy formed. Uh, the Confederacy had a council that would meet every year. They would coordinate their policies toward their weaker neighbors. And the neighbors knew what those were. They were informed. Uh, this is what the League of Peace has decided we're doing this year. Uh, they would discuss the issues among them. One interesting thing about this great council fire that they had every year is that while all of the council members were men, in some of these five nations, women were the ones who chose them. Uh, women in most of these nations, most of these five groups, also had the power to kind of review the laws that were made, to veto the laws that they felt were not ben beneficial. Now, the most striking feature of native society, by the time the Europeans arrived, was its sheer diversity. Each group had their own political system. Uh, each group had their own languages, uh, their own religion, their own, uh, you know, their, their own customs, their own ceremonies. The natives didn't think of themselves as a single people. They didn't think of themselves as Indians. That was something invented by Europeans who didn't see the differences between them. Most native identities centered on their immediate group, their village, their tribe, their confederacy. So when the Europeans arrived, 
students sometimes wonder, why didn't they all just band together and fight against the Europeans? But when the Europeans arrived, many of them were much more interested in forming an alliance with this new group to fight against their own traditional enemies instead of uniting against them. And nonetheless, the diverse Indian societies of North America did share certain common characteristics. And these particular characteristics were part of the reason why Europeans felt so justified in, in taking over, in judging the natives as inferior or heathen. For one, there was a difference in how people approached religion. In native life, there was very little separation between religion and secular. There really wasn't a concept for many groups of secularism. Religious ceremonies were directly related to everyday life, to hunting, to farming, to coming of age, to being a part uh, of this society. Most native groups, not all, but most, tended toward a belief system known as animism. And that's the belief that the whole world and, and every living thing has a spirit of its own, has a power of its own. Religious ceremonies were aimed at harnessing those powers, you know, harnessing the aid of some supernatural force to benefit the people. That's actually not very different than what Europeans did. A Europeans prayed. Europeans went to Mass. Right? They had religious ceremonies. They asked for God's blessing. Uh, they didn't see the similarities, though. Villages would hold elaborate religious rites that kind of helped define your role in the community. In all of these societies, people who seem to have special skills, special abilities, like wisdom, healing abilities, they held positions of respect and authority. Now, unlike the Christian world, Indian religion didn't seem to have a, a sharp distinction, or sometimes any distinction, between natural and supernatural. But in some respects, their beliefs were not very different from European beliefs. Many native groups, yes, they believed that there was a powerful spirit in living things, but many of them also believed in one single creator. And of course, even though Europeans tended to denounce native rituals and native ceremonies as, as being superstitious. Europeans were certainly not free of, of those same kinds of activities. Uh, carving jack-o'-lanterns. Anybody carved a jack-o'-lantern for Halloween? And that was started to try to drive away evil spirits, and it was started in Christian Europe. So they had their, their same little things. Uh, nonetheless, nearly all Europeans pretty quickly decided that Indians were in dire need of being converted to Christianity. In some cases, that was out of a genuine desire to spread salvation as they saw it, but for others it was just an excuse to exploit the natives and their land. And the native attitude toward land, yeah, let's stay back here, uh, was another thing that Europeans didn't really understand. In most native communities in what's now the United States, the idea of private property was not at all like the European idea. Most groups didn't have an idea of private property at all. And the more nomadic a group was, the less their ideas of land ownership and land management was like the Europeans' ideas. So you would have nomadic or semi-nomadic hunting groups that would have, they would have a big area where they hunted. And they would have a smaller area where they kind of settled during the winter, where they would have some farming, some gardens. And all of this could be used, big hunting area, smaller settling area, could be used by that nation as a whole. Now, they might grant permission for some other tribes, some other local villages to come in and do some hunting, but they might also fight to make sure that other groups couldn't come into this land. But regardless, this land was for everybody in that nation, everybody in that tribe. And then as you get more settled, you get towns and villages, and usually all of the land in that village would be open to everybody who lived there. It wasn't this particular person's land, this is the village land, we all use it equally. <laughs> 
Now, there were a couple of tribes in the southeast um, that did have ideas of private property that were much more similar to Europeans. Uh, this is the family land. But, of course, nobody had a deed to this land. Nobody had the paperwork. Nobody had proof, as Europeans understood it. What they had was, this is our land, because it's our land. Uh, we've, we've hunted here, we've planted here for hundreds and thousands of years. It's our land. What do you mean? And oftentimes, when Europeans came over and they tried to buy land or tried to trade for land, there was a real disconnect between what Europeans thought was happening and, and what Native Americans thought was happening. Europeans thought they were buying the land, thought they were trading for this land, and then this land would be theirs, only theirs, forever theirs, these other people go away. That didn't make sense to most native peoples. Uh, even into the 1800s, I believe it was Sitting Bull who said, you can't buy land. It, it doesn't make sense. You can't buy land like you can't buy air, like you can't buy the seas. You don't make land. So it's not something that you yourself can own. You can only own what you've made. But the land and the air and the seas are for everybody. So when they would take, uh, they would take the creative guns, or they would take the, the creative the farming tools, or they would take the $23 in beads, whatever it was for Manhattan Island, they never thought, it, it never crossed their mind that they would now be expected to leave that land, that they could never come back, that they could never hunt there, they could never plant there, they could never live there again. They thought they were sharing that land with Europeans. Like the Manhattan Island incident. You may have heard about this. This was a story they like to tell when I was still in grade school. Uh, when the Dutch first came over, they gave 23, 24-ish dollars in beads to a group of Indians and bought all of Manhattan Island. It's a wonderful real estate deal. That's not exactly what happened, though. Certainly not from the native point of view. See, the people that they gave the beads to didn't live on Manhattan Island. They had been granted permission from the people who did live there to come and hunt. When they took the beads, they thought that they were extending that permission. Yes, Dutch people come along and hunt with us. They never meant that they would never be allowed to come back there. They certainly never meant that the tribe that had granted them that permission would then be rounded up and forced off. That just didn't make any sense to them. With a few exceptions, like the Natchez, Native American societies tended not to be stratified. There wasn't a lot of hierarchy. There wasn't a lot of emphasis on building up wealth and possessions. And for one thing, if you're semi-nomadic, uh, or even if you're in a farming village that has to move to new cropland every few years to let the soil rest, it doesn't make sense to cart around a bunch of crap. You don't want to build up a lot of possessions because you're just going to have to move it with you. And in the majority of nations, leadership was not inherited. Leaders, councilmen, chiefs, they were elected. Usually not even elected for life. Elected for, all right, we got this crisis right now. <laughs> Who is the best guy to deal with it? There just wasn't as strict a hierarchy. In general, wealth and inherited status meant much less to native peoples than to Europeans. There usually wasn't extreme inequality within a particular tribe either. Typically, if somebody in a village was starving, it was because the crops had failed and everybody was starving, not because that one person was on the bottom rungs of, so <coughs> of society. And speaking of bottom rungs, the status of women freaked Europeans out a lot. Now, European women lived under very, very strict rules. Uh, some stricter than others, depending on what country you were coming from. But the first women that Europeans met over here were the ones who lived in the South, down in the Caribbean, in Mexico, where it's warm, where they didn't wear quite so many clothes as European women. They didn't wear all the layers, particularly because Europe was starting to feel the effect of a little ice age. For about 550 years, glaciers in northern Europe started to expand. Winters were pretty brutal. Sometimes they didn't even have a summer. Uh, and of course, people were wearing 
lots more clothes, many more layers of clothes covering up a lot more. So then they came to the New World, they came to Cuba and Barbados and Jamaica, and these women were scantily clad and didn't even seem to care. Many of them didn't have any objections, no social taboos against premarital sex. They were allowed to marry who they want without getting somebody's permission. They were allowed to divorce if they wanted to do it. They controlled their own home. They owned their tools. They got the benefit of whatever trade they personally did. My God, it's like anarchy. You're just letting women do whatever they want. Many of the tribes that they met at first contact were matrilineal, which gave precedence to mothers. Council members did tend to be men. But like with the Iroquois, they were often chosen or approved of by the women. Women were allowed to take part in village meetings. Now you look at the English, by contrast, under English law, married women had no legal existence at all. A married man controlled his family's property entirely. His wife had no independent legal identity. Indian women owned their tools, their homes, the profits of what they made. In nations that did a lot of hunting when the men were gone, the women ran the village economy, the village government. Europeans totally freaked out by that. So that's a little of what Europeans thought of Native Americans when they first met. But how did that happen? How, how did that meeting actually come about? I mean, we all know uh, Columbus in 1492 and Ocean Blue. Some of you may have heard about the Viking explorations up in Canada in the late 900s, but that didn't last very long. What really started this exploratory push that ended up sending people across the ocean was a desire for trade goods, particularly Asian and African trade goods, spices, silks, ebony, ivory. Um, Western Europe had been trading with China and India and surrounding nations for a long time by this point. They traded along what was known as the Silk Road, uh, which was actually several different paths, several different uh, ways to travel, but essentially it all took you through Central Asia to try to get to India and China and get this stuff and bring it back. When the Silk Road was well controlled. It took about a year to get from Italy out to your destination in China or India, then another year to get back. So it was a long journey, not really a fun journey. The Mongols, for, for many years, controlled the Silk Road. We don't think of the Mongols as being like great traders. For the Mongols, we think of the Mongol hordes that swept through Europe and raping and pillaging and destroying all of these nations. But they actually were very efficient at making money, controlling a trade route and taxing the merchants on it, making sure they live so they can pay the taxes the next time they come through. That's good business. So while the Mongols were in charge, it was a long trip, but you could probably make it there and back alive. Then when the Mongol Empire collapsed, the road got really nasty. Warlords, bandits took over. You might be protected for this stretch of road, but not this stretch of road. If you got all the way out there, there's no guarantee you're going to get back. European traders tried going through the Turks, having uh, Turkish navigators and sailors help them. But if you know anything about European history, uh, the 11, 12, 1300s, not really a great time for uh, Turkish-European relations. We were having all those wars, the Crusades. And they weren't always willing uh, to help European merchants. So while Europe was trying to figure out how to get to Asia, all of a sudden they started noticing another nation the nation of Mali. Uh, it, which is in sub-Saharan Africa. Everything south of the brown. Most of Africa is sub-Saharan Africa. Now they'd been trading with North Africa, which was ruled by the Ottoman Empire, which is the same people that ruled Turkey, and they were Muslim, and so off and on 
we didn't trade well with them. Uh, the rest of Africa was almost impossible to get to. If you wanted to get down here, you had to go across the desert. You couldn't sail there because there's a little quirk of geography along the western coast of Africa. You get about to the point where the desert changes, where it becomes sub-Saharan Africa, and the winds change. The winds from this point on only blow south, which is fine when you're on your way there and you're going south anyway. But once you get your stuff and you want to head back to Europe, you can't do it because the winds are going to continually push you south. Europe didn't have the naval technology at this time to tack against the wind. They could not sail against the wind at this point. And to be honest, until the early 1300s, they really didn't care. They didn't think there was anything all that interesting in sub-Saharan Africa to get anyway. But in 1324, all of a sudden, people started talking about the nation, the empire, of Mali. Now, Mali still exists. Uh, it's a nation in West Africa, right about there. The Mali Empire in 1324 was right about there. It was massive, wealthy, uh, diamond mines, gold mines. The emperor of Mali was Mansa Musa. He put his realm on the map, at least as far as Europeans were concerned when he made his Hajj to Mecca, his pilgrimage. He was Muslim. Mali was and is the majority Muslim nation. So their emperor went to Mecca, he made his pilgrimage, and while he was on that journey, he gave away so much gold. He endowed schools and universities and hospitals. He gave money to beggars, to dancing girls, to widows, to just whoever. And to him it was pocket change. And he had so much at home, he didn't miss any of it. But it was so much that it depreciated the value of gold in Europe for more than a decade. Of course, the rest of the world is going, where did he get all that gold? And most importantly, can we get some of that gold? It took him more than a century for a European power to make a sea voyage to Mali and back, but they did it. And that European power was Portugal. Now today, you, you might not think of Portugal as being uh, a big world power sort of thing, but man, in the, the 1300s and the 1400s, Portugal was where it was at if you wanted to travel or you wanted to trade. Portugal had a young prince that was very focused on making Portugal a great nation. He wanted to do it through travel and trade. So Prince Henry, they called him Henry the Navigator. He invited the best and brightest minds in naval technology to come to Portugal, to come to the school that he had founded, and build a new kind of navy, yeah, an up-to-date, progressive, uh, technologically advanced kind of navy. He brought people from a thousand miles away, people from the Netherlands, uh, who built sturdy boats, that could sail through the, the ice-choked North Sea. Uh, he brought in Turkish navigators. They developed new methods of map making. They learned how to use um, Arab navigational tools like the astrolabe. They built new kinds of tools. And they built a new kind of ship, the caravel. The caravel was sturdier than other ships of this age. It's not as likely to get broken up by a strong nasty wind. It's also very fast and very agile. And most importantly, the sails were different. The sails could tack against the wind. And that meant not only could they sail south along the coast of Africa, they could get home again. In 1434, 110 years after they started trying to get there, a Portuguese ship brought a sprig of rosemary from West Africa back to Portugal as proof that they had made the journey and come back. Little by little, Portuguese ships moved further down the coast. In 1485, they reached the nation of Benin. Uh, Benin's down here. Uh, Benin still exists today. Um, wonderful craftsmen, especially bronze crafting there in Benin. They started to 
uh, colonize uh, the islands off the coast. They started to establish trading posts. Most of the labor for this was supplied by African slaves. And then when the New World opened up, they moved their plantations and their slaves to the Americas. Now, slavery in Africa predated the Europeans. It was going on. It was going on everywhere in the world. But traditionally, African slaves were debtors, or they were criminals, or they were war captives. They had very well-defined legal rights. They were allowed to possess property. They were allowed to marry free people. Their children were not automatically slaves. Most African slaves were able to purchase their freedom or marry out of slavery, or when their debts paid off, then they're free. When the war's over, they're set free. Hardly anyone was enslaved for life. Slavery was one of lots of different kinds of labor in Africa. It was not the basis of the economy the way it became in the New World colonies. And when the Portuguese and then other Europeans started to get involved, it accelerated the slave trade within Africa. The rulers wanted to make more money. They wanted to be allies with European nations. And so they ramped up their raiding, their warring, uh, their imprisoning people for debt. At least 100,000 African slaves were transported to Spain and Portugal themselves between 1450 and 1500. This is, I mean, the, the New World wasn't even encountered until 1492, so a lot of this is going on even before they came to the New World. In 1502, the first African slaves were transported to islands in the Caribbean. Now, a few African nations, like Benin, actually, tried to stay out of it. They tried to opt out of this transatlantic trade because it was so far beyond what they knew. It was way beyond what they saw as the natural order of things. Uh, you make somebody a slave to pay off a debt. Right? He pays it off, then he's free. You don't make somebody a slave for life. You don't send them we don't even know how many miles away from home where they can never come back and never see their... F Why are you even thinking about this? More powerful nations, though, chose to go along with it. It was a money maker. It was an ally maker. It was a power maker. Now, something that a lot of people don't understand, uh, a question that a lot of students have is, why were Africans enslaving their own people? Why would they help Europeans enslave their own people? And the answer to that is, they weren't. No African nation kidnapped, sold, enslaved their own people. They did it to their enemies. They did it to their traditional rivals. They did it to other peoples. It's like the United States can go to war with Mexico. We don't think of it as attacking our own people. It's, it's a different nation. It's a different country. It's a different government. Completely separate. So when Mali invades Ghana, when Mali invades Benin, and Mali was a big player in this, they were not attacking their own people. They were attacking their traditional rivals. And it made sense to them. It was weakening their rivals, weakening their enemies. Now, traditionally, you go to war against another nation. You take prisoners of war. You gotta feed them. You gotta house them. Eventually the war's gonna end. You're gonna have to set them free. And then if there's another war, they're just gonna come back and fight against you again. Or you sell them to Portugal. You sell them to Spain. You sell them to the Netherlands or to England or whatever. They take them away. You don't have to feed them. Somebody else does that. You don't have to house them. Somebody else does that. And they are never gonna come back home and make trouble for you again. So that was a, a good deal for them, I guess. A Christopher Columbus. This is an, another one of those what we know and what we think we know and what we might not know situations. A lot of what we think we know about Columbus um, was written down by Columbus himself. He was known to exaggerate on occasion. We're pretty sure he was Italian. Um, and we say he was born in Genoa, Italy. That's what he said. And we see no reason to really contradict that. No actual proof that he was from Genoa, but no proof that he wasn't either. 
he was a seasoned mariner. He was uh, a very experienced navigator. For years, Columbus had sailed around the Mediterranean, around the North Atlantic Ocean, studying the currents and the winds, because he'd gotten this idea that maybe we could sail all the way to Asia. Now, I don't know if they're still telling this story in schools. When I was in grade school, they were still telling us this cockamamie tale, that Columbus was the only person who knew the Earth was round. That everybody else believed the earth was flat. That the sailors who were traveling with him wept in fear. They thought they were going to sail right off the edge of the earth and just fall into nothingness. That's bullcrap. Everybody knew the earth was round. Everybody knew it. The reason why Columbus couldn't get support is because his math was wrong. He had miscalculated the circumference of the earth, how big around the earth is. Um, now, nobody in Europe knew that there were these two big giant continents blocking the way, but they knew for sure that it would take longer than Columbus thought to reach China if he sailed west. Columbus thought he could do it in about a month. I suppose if they had asked the Vikings, the Vikings could have told them about these continents in the way, but nobody asked them. Uh, Columbus went around Europe for quite a few years. He sent his brother around Europe trying to find a king or a nobleman or just a wealthy guy that could support his journey, that could pay for the boats and the sailors. His brother actually went to the King of England, Henry VII, the first Tudor King of England. That's kind of a fun rabbit hole to go down, I think. How would U.S. history be different if England had been the country to start colonizing the Americas? I mean, the whole world could be different today. But Henry VII was a notorious tightwad, and also he had advisors telling him that Columbus had his math wrong. Most of Columbus's fellow navigators knew that he had drastically underestimated the size of the earth, and it kind of sucks if you're trying to get money out of a king, and then there's a guy standing right next to him saying, oh man, you are so wrong, you know you're wrong, your journey is never going to work, it, it undermines your argument. Eventually, Spain agreed to help. King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella of Spain became his sponsors. A particular set of circumstances led them to make this decision. They really didn't think that he could make it. They had their own people telling them that his math was wrong. They figured he was going to fail, so they didn't give him a lot of money. But they thought it was worth a gamble anyway. Ferdinand and Isabella had been born into two separate Spanish kingdoms. Ferdinand of Aragon, Isabella of Castilla. Um, Spain had been undergoing a civil war. The, the different nations of Spain had been fighting with each other. When they married, they unified Spain. And then they took their unified power and they forced out the Moors who had been ruling Spain for a few hundred years at that point. The Moors were, were North African Muslims who had come up into Spain and, and for a few hundred years uh, had been controlling it. So with their combined power, they pushed them out. And Spain was a, an intact, unified nation for the first time. So they're riding high. This happened, actually, the, the final battle that drove the Moors out happened in 1492 early in 1492. So they've had this wonderful success. Uh, they want to know, what are we going to do next? We've got to do something to top. We're a unified nation. We want to prove that we're a strong nation. We want to become a world power. Look at what Portugal has been doing. They've got some explorations going on. They've got some trade going on. We, we want to get into that. And also they wanted the trappings of royalty. They wanted the trappings of having a strong country. They wanted silk. They wanted spices. They wanted all of those things that you get from Asia, but they can't take the land route, right? Because they have just been fighting against Muslim Ottoman Moors. So the Ottomans are not going to let them pass through. So there's this guy, and he's got this weird idea that he can sail west for a month He'll hit Asia. He can bring back the stuff that they want. Uh, make their nation great. And, and you know, if they are the nation to sponsor this trip, then it looks really good for them. 
right? Then they become like the new Portugal. So they gave him a little bit of money, uh, not much. They gave him enough enough for three ships and not a whole lot of sailors. Uh, they gave him royal letters of introduction to give to whatever ruler he might stumble across. They authorized him to negotiate trade agreements on their behalf, and they sent him off. Never really expected that he'd come back. On October 12th, 1492, after 33 days of sailing, Columbus and his expedition arrived in the Bahamas. And hey, Columbus had predicted that he would hit Asia in about a month. So, hey, we're here. We're not entirely certain where he, uh, he landed. Uh, he called the island where he landed San Salvador. Now, there is an island in the Caribbean that is called San Salvador. We don't know if that's actually the right place or if people just started calling it that because they think it's the right place. So Columbus was like, yay, I found India. Oh, wait, this place is tiny. Well, I found an island off the coast of India. Columbus always believed that he had found Asia. He went to his grave believing that he had found Asia. But he just couldn't find the mainland. So he went island hopping. He found Cuba. Yay! Ah, oh, it's just another island. He found Hispaniola. Yay! Damn, it's just another island. When he went back to Spain, Columbus took ten natives of Hispaniola to prove that he had found Asia and also so they could be converted to Christianity. The next year, 1493, Columbus went back. Ferdinand and Isabella, mostly Isabella actually, were so thrilled at this that they gave him 17 ships and more than a thousand men, and the colonization of the New World began. Now, they tried to establish a Spanish outpost there on Hispaniola. It took a while. It took until about 1502 to really get going. Explorations by other men, paid by Spain, like Amerigo Vespucci, found the coastline of South America. Uh, pretty conclusively proved that this was not Asia, that this was something entirely new. Now, the general consensus, right, is that America gets its name from Amerigo Vespucci, but over the last couple of years, some linguists have noted that the natives of Venezuela call their land Amaraca. So, maybe not. Don't actually know what we know and what we think we know. And nobody knows exactly how many people lived in North and South America at the time of Columbus's voyages. Estimates about 75 million. For comparison, the population of Europe was about 70 million at the time. Most natives of the New World lived in Central and South America. Current estimates put the U.S. population uh, at about 10 million. But whatever the number was, the Indian population suffered a catastrophic decline because of contact with Europeans and their wars and enslavement and especially diseases like smallpox and influenza and measles. But you build up immunity. You build up antibodies to these diseases by being exposed to them, especially as children. But these people had never been exposed to these kinds of illnesses, so there was no built-up immunity. And the result was just devastating. Many nations in the West Indies, the ones that met Columbus right off the bat, were just wiped out before anybody could figure out what was happening. On Hispaniola, at the time of first contact, the population was about 300,000 people. In 50 years, they were almost all gone. The population of Mexico fell by 90% in one century, from 20 million people down to 2 million. And as for here, as for the area that's now the United States, our population continued to fall through the 15 and 16 and 17 and 18 hundreds, uh, reached a low point around 1900 at 250,000 people. Now the speed of European exploration was really remarkable. Uh, how quickly, uh, not just Spain, but other nations as well, got on the bandwagon and started sending explorers over. A lot of that speed is due to an invention that you might not think about in terms of exploration, and that's the printing press. Gutenberg's printing press with movable type had been invented in the 1430s, which meant that it's a lot faster to send information around the continent, you know, to people who can read which was not a huge part of the population back then. 
Uh, John Cabot, who was also an Italian, he sailed to Newfoundland in 1497, Newfoundland on the coast of Canada. He sold, uh, he sailed rather, in the pay of Henry the Seventh of England, who had refused to back Columbus. He backed Cabot once it became clear that there was actually something there. Soon, fishermen from England and France and Spain were fishing along the coast of Canada and, and taking their haul back to Europe. Now the Portuguese, they came over, they claimed Brazil in 1500, but it was the Spanish who took the lead in exploration and conquest. Mostly, certainly in the beginning, they were looking for wealth. They were looking for spices and gold and silver, but they took with them missionaries. They carried flags with crosses on them. They demanded that the natives convert or die. The first explorer to encounter one of the major urban civilizations was Hernan Cortez. He arrived in the city of Tenochtitlan in 1519. Tenochtitlan was the capital of the Aztec Empire. It had about 200,000 residents. Even by European standards, it was a massive city. Had a big temple complex, had a royal palace, had a beautiful central market. One of Cortez's men said that it looked like an enchanted vision. It was the center of this very powerful empire. The Aztecs' wealth, the Aztecs' power, rested on their ability to dominate their neighbors. They demanded payment from their neighbors, crops, gold. They sacrificed prisoners of war. Now the Spanish already tended to view all the natives as barbarians, and that practice of the Aztecs just reinforced that view. I, I think we can all agree that human sacrifice is bad, but we do need to remember that Europe wasn't much better. In Spain, at this same time, men and women were being burned at the stake as religious heretics. Criminals were executed in just gory public spectacles. Now, it didn't take long for Cortes to conquer the city. Some people like to say that that's evidence that Europeans were obviously superior. And yes, Cortes had better firepower. But he only had a few hundred men. His firepower was not that good. Cortes won because he went to other natives. He went to those neighbors. He went to those people that the Aztecs had subjugated and said, They took your food. They took your gold. They took your sons. I can help you kill that SOB, if you will join with me. And of course, he was helped along by a smallpox epidemic that wiped out a, a good portion of the Aztec army. Pretty soon, fleets of ships carried gold and silver from the mines of Mexico back to Europe, making Spain the wealthiest nation on the continent. By the middle of the 1500s, Spain had established a massive empire. Not just in the New World. The Spanish Empire at its height covered a goodly portion of the entire globe. Everything in yellow was controlled by Spain at one point. Uh, and it was pretty much by the middle of the 1500s that Spain had this land. Their New World Empire stretched from the Andes in South America through most of, of the continent of South America, except for Brazil, which again was claimed by Portugal, uh, up through Mexico, included most of what is now the United States as well. A Spain's empire was bigger than the ancient Roman Empire. Their center in North America was Mexico City, a magnificent capital built on the ruins of Tenochtitlan. Churches, hospitals, monasteries. The first university in the Americas was Mexico City. It still exists. It's a very, very large university. It has a couple hundred thousand students, actually. Now, when other nations started to come over, like the French and the Spanish, when they started to come over, they tended to be kind of scattered around, more rural people. But the Spanish really wanted their people congregating together. They wanted an empire of towns. They wanted an urban civilization. For centuries, uh, Spanish-American cities like Mexico City and Lima and Quito were much more impressive than a lot of cities back in Europe. Now, the Spanish Empire's size was not the only remarkable thing about it. 
they also had a very extensive and at first very efficient governing system. Uh, after the conquistadors swept through with the raping and the pillaging, the Spanish crown kind of freaked out and replaced them with a more stable form of government. They wanted lawyers and bureaucrats and not so much swords. At first, the government of Spanish America was very similar to the government of Spain itself. Spain had absolute rulers, or rulers who considered themselves absolute which meant that they claimed to have power and control and the right to control every aspect of society, to, to be micromanagers, basically, in, in modern terms. Uh, and they wanted to reproduce that in the New World. The king was at the absolute top. And the king created a council of the Indies to handle the colonies. The council would appoint officials to send over to the New World with the king's approval. Uh, in the New World itself, there was supposed to be no democracy, no town councils, no elections, nothing like that. And everything that the governors of the different colonies did was supposed to be sent back and approved by the king. Now, the Catholic Church also played a significant role in these colonies <coughs> in how they were ruled. The Pope had full authority over matters of faith and morals and treatment of the Indians. Now, Spanish kings, they didn't like democracy in their own country. They sure didn't want it to spread to their new world empire. So officials were appointed, not elected. They were usually born in Spain itself. Uh, the rulers of Spain tended not to like to appoint people who had been born in the Americas. Fresh new officials coming from Spain kept the empire and the king on everybody's mind. And they continually refreshed Spanish customs and Spanish traditions. You appoint officials who were born there in the colonies and had never been to Spain. Eventually people forget about the king there across the ocean. But every year or so you got new officials coming in. The king's on everybody's mind. You remember who you owe your allegiance to. You remember who has power. Now, that system lasted for about as long as Spain remained a strong, relevant power in Europe. And eventually, uh, they lost that power. By the late 1500s, the Great Spanish Armada had been all but destroyed. Uh, in the early 1600s, their European possessions started to crumble. Uh, you'll note Spain didn't just control, uh, you know, parts of the Americas and parts of Africa and parts of Asia. They also took over a significant portion of their European neighbors as well. They controlled the Netherlands, the German states, parts of Austria and Hungary, briefly parts of Italy as well. Presumably they would have gone on controlling all of these places. But there was this one guy this pesky little priest named Martin Luther. He got the whole continent all stirred up, started the Protestant Reformation. Now Spain was Catholic. The Netherlands, the German states, which Spain controlled, they were at the heart of the Reformation. So instead of being able to concentrate on their, their massive, profitable American empire, Spain had to turn its back and pay attention to these smaller European countries that are now in rebellion. Uh, these religious wars went on for about 200 years, and they took time, they took money, they took attention away from the Americas. And that meant that American-born Spanish citizens, criollos, were able to take on more and more control. They started forming their own councils, which they were not supposed to do. They even started allowing some elections, which they were really not supposed to do. And they'd send letters back saying, Hey, your majesty, we know you're busy, so we went ahead and wrote this list of recommendations. We promise they're good. We've already put them in place, and it's all working, so just go ahead and stamp it. Eventually, uh, entire city councils were being elected. And along with the monasteries and the universities and the craftsmen's guilds, they pretty much seized control of Spain's American empire. Now, even though there had been a massive decline in the native population, Spanish America still had enough 
Indians, uh, that for the most part they decided there was no need for a large-scale African slave trade. Out on the islands, where people were wiped out very quickly, they did bring African slaves in. But on the mainland, it was tens of thousands of Indians working in gold and silver mines. They supplied the wealth of the empire. They worked on, on the big farms, the haciendas, controlled by Spanish landlords. In Spanish America, unlike the other New World empires, Indians performed most of the labor. Now, the Spanish did introduce new kinds of livestock and uh, wheat and sugar, but the main agricultural crops were the same ones that had been grown all along, the corn and beans and squash. Uh, Spanish citizens were encouraged to settle in the New World, not just go over for wealth. And a lot of them did go for the chance to had land, had social advancement. Now, in Europe at this time, owning land was a mark of nobility. It was the basis of your wealth, and it was the basis of your power. In every European nation, your power, your, your freedoms, your privileges, were based on how much land you owned. So in the first 300 years, about 750,000 Spaniards went to the Americas looking for land. At first, the vast majority were young, single men, many of them from you know, the bottom rungs of society, craftsmen, soldiers, laborers, men who had no chance at advancement back home. Um, all of them, of course, wanted slaves, because building wealth without having to work for it yourself was, again, a sign of nobility. The New World provided them a lot of opportunities to advance. The most successful were able to enjoy luxuries that they would never have seen back home. Now, the people who had actually been born in Spain were still at the top of the pyramid, but within a hundred years or so, they were only a tiny percentage of the population, uh, mixed-race people, and American-born Spanish citizens became the largest part. Uh, an intermixing of cultures started uh, at first contact. By 1600, those mestizos, as people of mixed origin, made up the largest part of the urban population. In the century that followed, uh, by the 1700s, those mestizos had essentially repopulated Mexico, where disease had so wiped out the original peoples. Over time, Spanish America evolved into a hybrid culture, part Spanish, part Indian, uh, in some places part African as well, with a single religion and language and government, officially, anyway. An example of this blending of culture is uh, the Virgin of Guadalupe. Even if you don't know her name, you have probably seen her picture, uh, this symbol. Uh, in 1531, an Indian woman reported seeing a vision of the Virgin Mary as a dark-skinned Indian woman uh, near her village, Guadalupe. And the Virgin of Guadalupe came to be revered by millions of people, Indian and Mestizo and Spanish. And she is a symbol of the modern nation of Mexico. A very few Spaniards stopped to wonder exactly what gave them the right to claim lands that belonged to somebody else. But they had immense confidence in the superiority of Spanish culture. Spanish culture is the best. Everybody should accept Spanish culture. And if they don't want to, well, there's just something wrong with them. When indigenous people resisted, when they refused to give up their own beliefs and traditions, it reinforced that opinion that these people were uncivilized heathens, maybe not even capable of becoming civilized. A Europeans brought with them not only a, a long history of violence against other nations, and sometimes their own people, but also a real missionary zeal to spread the benefits of being Spanish, of Spanish civilization. Now, the Pope helped the Spanish Empire along by officially dividing the Western Hemisphere between Spain and Portugal in 1493. Uh, Portugal got to claim Brazil. The Pope said Spain could claim the rest. Now, the Pope totally ignored the rest of Europe, and that is going to have an effect during the Reformation. One of the reasons why Spain and Portugal stayed so resolutely Catholic uh, 
is because the popes generally treated them pretty good. But Northern Europe felt kind of screwed in this deal, and so they were more favorable toward Protestantism, uh, just as a political mechanism. Now, the Pope justified this division of the world by telling Spain and Portugal that they must spread Catholicism among the natives. And Spain and Portugal were already used to that. Now, they were used to forced conversions with uh, wars against the Muslims and persecuting the Jews. This is the Spanish Inquisition start of. Uh, to them, national glory and a religious mission went hand in hand. Spain insisted that their primary goal in colonization was to save the Indians. They said that their goal wasn't to exterminate them, not to steal their land, but to transform them into obedient subjects. Uh, many Spanish writers insisted that Indians could maybe eventually be raised up to the level of European civilization. But of course to do that, their existing governments and cultures and spiritual lives would have to be destroyed. Uh, to the Spanish colonizers, to the people who were actually coming over and taking the land, the large native population was not just souls to be saved. They were also a labor force to be organized to get the gold and the silver that Spain wanted. The tension between those two goals, save the souls, get the gold, the tension there really scarred Spanish rule in America for a good 300 years. On the one hand, Spanish governors proclaimed that they were bringing true freedom to the Indians by showing them how to correct their old heathen ways. On the other hand, Spanish rule caused a disastrous fall of the Indian population, not just because of epidemics, but because of the brutal conditions that they were subject to. The conquistadors and the governors required people to acknowledge the Catholic Church and to provide tribute of gold and silver. Man, I bet the neighbors of the Aztecs were just pissed off about that. Now you help Hernan Cortez, help him take over the Aztec Empire, so you don't have to pay this tribute anymore, and whoops, now he wants tribute. Now, most Spaniards saw no conflict, they saw no contradiction between serving God and enriching themselves. But after a while, some people did start to see a conflict. As early as 1537, the Pope, Pope Paul III, outlawed the enslavement of Indians. He declared Indians to be truly men, in his words, must not be treated like animals. He did this in part because he was getting a lot of reports from a Spanish priest named Bartolome de las Casas about the devastation faced by the indigenous population. A las Casas had as long a history in the New World as any other Spaniard did. His father had sailed with Columbus on his second journey. Las Casas himself had been a conquistador. He had taken part in the plunder of the Incan Empire in Peru. Um, he had owned Indians on Cuba and Hispaniola. But in 1514, Las Casas had a moment, he had his road to Damascus moment, freed his slaves, started preaching against the injustices that he saw in these colonies. Las Casas denounced his nation for causing the deaths of millions of innocent people. He reported, in his exact words, it is Spain's practice in every land they discover to stage a massacre to make the inhabitants fear them. He listed in really shocking detail the cruelties carried out by colonizers. Probably the least shocking is burning alive men, women, and children to scare the survivors into being cooperative. Las Casas insisted that Indians were rational human beings, not barbarians, and he insisted that Spain had no right, had no grounds, to deprive them of their freedom. Now, he did believe that the king of Spain had a right to govern the Americas, that the government of Spain should rule the Americas, but he argued that Indians should be subjects, just like Spaniards were that they should be citizens, that they should have those privileges. Now, largely because of Las Casas' efforts, 
Spain began to change their laws. In 1542, they passed a set of laws known as New Laws. The New Laws said that the Indians could no longer be enslaved. Uh, in 1550, Spain abolished that old encomienda system, which had allowed landlords to have full authority over the Indians on their land. In its place, the government created the repartimiento system. Under this new system, people who lived in Indian villages were free. They were entitled to wages for the work they performed. They had access to land under Spanish laws. They could not be bought and sold. But they were also required to provide a certain amount of labor every year for local landlords and for the local church. So it did still allow a lot of abuses by Spanish landlords and by priests. Sometimes the priests would put a, an excessive amount of work as, as a contingent for being allowed to convert. Now by the end of the 1500s, work in the Spanish Empire consisted largely of forced wage labor by natives. Uh, on the islands, some slave labor by Africans. Uh, a few parts of the mainland had that as well. Like all empires, Spain's was highly exploitative. Over time, the initial brutal treatment of Indians would improve somewhat, but Las Casas' writings uh, and the writings of other people like him, the abuses that they exposed, contributed to a really nasty reputation for Spain. They called it the Black Legend, this idea that Spain was uniquely brutal, more so than any other nation that they were uniquely exploitative, way worse than any other nation, which was not entirely true. But that would become a, a potent justification for other European powers when they started trying to challenge Spain's control of the New World. And we're going to take a minute or two and go off on a, a little tangent about the Great Biological Exchange, also known as the Columbian Exchange. And what this is, is you've got two groups of people, broadly, two groups of people coming into contact. Europeans and, and Americans. Uh, they were seeing things that they had never seen before. They were eating things they'd never eaten before. There were new kinds of animals. And the exchange was people coming from Europe with native European things that had not been seen in the New World, and then taking Native American things back to the Old World that they had never seen before, and just completely changing the world by doing this. A lot of how we, we just assume the world works today comes from this biological exchange. The way the world works today, the assumptions that we make, uh, of course these people do that, of course these people have that, was completely different in 1491, before first contact. Like, think of the, the stereotype of the Plains nations, you know, uh, like Lakota and, and Pawnee and people like that. Uh, the stereotype is they, they get on their horses and they ride long distances across the plains with the feathers and the hair streaming in the wind, hunting buffalo over these vast spaces. Well, they hunted buffalo, sure, but they did it on foot because horses are not native to the New World. The first horses they got uh, were a small group of Mustangs that, that escaped from the Spaniards in the early 1500s. Completely changed the way the Plains nations lived. So completely that we don't even realize there was a change. That we just assume that's how it always was. Uh, part of the change was a lot more warfare, actually. See, when you've got a horse, you can hunt across a lot more land, a lot more distances than you could just on foot, which means now you're bumping into some other nation's territory, and they're bumping into yours, and neither of you really like it. So we're going to have some conflict there over who gets to hunt where and whether or not we're going to be friends. A lot of the, the plants, the crops, that we think of as being South American or Central American crops are not native to the Americas. Like Colombian coffee, bold flavor Colombian coffee, uh, the commercials with the little guy and his burro and he's bringing the coffee down from the mountains of Colombia. 
Uh, coffee's not native to the New World. Coffee comes from the Middle East. Sugarcane. Sugarcane today is mostly grown in the Caribbean. Uh, particularly Barbados, countries like that. Sugarcane is not native to the Caribbean. It is native to Africa. Uh, dandelions. I like this example. You spend a lot of time uh, taking care of your yard. You've probably cursed the maker of dandelions. Or when you were a kid, uh, you know, you picked them up and you blew the head off and you made a wish. Native American kids, pre-Columbus, could not make a wish on dandelions because they didn't have any. Europeans brought them here. And you might wonder why on earth they would bring over those nasty invasive weeds. They didn't do it just to annoy gardeners. They brought them over because dandelions are a crop. They're a food crop. You can eat them. You can saute the greens. You can use them in salads. You can make dandelion wine. And they're ridiculously easy to grow, right? You don't even have to try to grow them. Europeans also brought over infectious airborne diseases. Native Americans had no resistance to these diseases. They had no resistance against any airborne disease. Not what we think of as the major ones. Airborne diseases spread through coughing, or sneezing, or contact with the air, like measles and flu and smallpox. Those kinds of, of diseases, airborne diseases, did not exist in the New World. Native Americans had never been exposed to them, so they had no resistance. Now, there is some evidence of a plague-like virus that struck North America a couple hundred years before Columbus, but it had gone dormant by the time of first contact. There were generation after generation who had grown up with no exposure to airborne disease. Now, there were blood-borne diseases. They were sexually transmitted infections. So it's not like the New World was this disease for utopia. It's just that these particular kinds were completely different, it, just in, in how they were transmitted from person to person. Smallpox was the worst. Smallpox is what absolutely devastated the native population from the Caribbean up to Alaska. Natives who came into contact with it might go and trade with another group carrying it, but not showing any symptoms. And then a member of that group would go and, and carry the trade on a little further, not showing any symptoms. It was like a wildfire across the continent. People who had never seen a European, people who had never heard of a European, were dying of smallpox. Now, there were things that went from the New World to the Old World. Plants were probably the most important of these. The crops of the Americas absolutely transformed the rest of the world. For example, Ireland. In Ireland, we think of Irish potatoes. Irish Americans are the second largest ancestral group in the United States. Their big settlement came during the potato famine. Well, if we hadn't had this contact with the New World, there would have been no potato famine because they wouldn't have had potatoes. What about Italian food or Italian-American food, I guess? The most popular kinds of pasta sauce are tomato-based sauces, like marinara, bolognese. But before 1500, there were no tomato-based pasta sauces. Strictly an American product. You try going to the Olive Garden in 1491 in Rome and asking for spaghetti bolognese, they're not going to know what you're talking about. Now, every region of Italy has some tomato-based sauce. It's especially popular in southern Italy. Who can imagine spaghetti without it? But they didn't have it before the Colombian Exchange. Now, there was at least one major disease that was American in origin, and that was syphilis. Syphilis is a really unfortunate sexually transmitted disease that can cause deformities, that can essentially cause your extremities, your fingers and your toes and your nose and your skin eventually to just kind of rot and fall off, and then eventually it will kill you. Uh, when Columbus returned home, when he went back to Spain after his first voyage, several of his sailors were already infected with syphilis that they had picked up in the Caribbean islands, so we know what they were doing. 
Uh, several of the wars throughout the 16 and 17 and even 1800s were affected. The outcome of these wars were affected by the fact that some group of soldiers was suffering worse from syphilis than another group. They picked it up from somebody who'd gotten it from a sailor who'd been to the New World. Now, the French invasion of Italy failed in large part because the French army was devastated by deaths from syphilis. It was still a major fear into into the First World War, uh, which was less than a hundred years ago. They took an awful lot of precautions to protect soldiers from syphilis in the First World War. Uh, when you look at it, it is remarkable how profoundly this exchange, this just simply sharing different plants and different animals and sleeping with each other, can affect the world that we live in. Not just in North America, but all over the globe. The foods that we eat, the animals that we have, uh, the diseases that we catch as well. And one of the things that we talk about a lot in U.S. history is freedom. What is freedom? What does it mean now? What did it mean then? And depending on when the then was, it meant vastly different things. The kind of freedom that early European settlers wanted and understood was not the same as freedom as understood by the natives. The Europeans believed that Indians were too free, but also that they were desperately in need of being freed from their own culture. In Europe, they didn't think of freedom the way we think of it today. Freedom was not a right. There, there was no idea of inborn rights. Freedom was a privilege. And privilege means private law. So the freedom that people had depended very much on their social class, on their status, on their station in life. The privileges that came with those particular statuses. Uh, remember, the time period that we're talking about, this time of first contact, 1492 is still the medieval era. Feudalism is still widespread in most of Europe. Uh, feudalism is where if you're a good supporter of the king, he will give you a chunk of land and all of the people that live on it. Uh, serfs worked the land. They were not free in any sense. Um, you could demand military service from them. They were not allowed to leave the land without their lord's permission. They, they just had no freedoms at all. Now in England, it was in decline. That particular system was starting to decline. But it wasn't outlawed until 1660, which is well after England started establishing colonies in the New World. In France, uh, their feudalism lasted until their revolution in the 1780s. In Russia, it lasted into the 20th century. Their ideas of freedom are not ours. Let's look more closely at England, though. Um, England was a little different from France and Spain. Their feudalism was starting to decline already. They did have a parliament, which was similar-ish to Congress. Parliament has two houses, just like Congress does. But one of those houses is the House of Lords. That is not an elected house. If you had a title, if you were the Duke of Ottawa County, you automatically got a seat in the House of Lords. And then you'd pass it on to your son and his son and on down the line. These were the folks who advised the king. These were the folks who tried aristocratic criminals. These were the folks who passed most of the laws. Unelected people had that power. A parliament also has a House of Commons. They are elected. Now, the commons in the 14-1500s didn't have much power, though. And mostly the commons were made up of very, very wealthy men who wanted to become nobility. They wanted to move up into the House of Lords. They were elected only by other wealthy men. Most of the adult men couldn't vote. You had to own a certain amount of land. And well over half the men in England had no land at all. So they didn't really represent the majority of the people. And all these different levels of society, they all had their own privileges, their own freedoms. Serfs, nothing at all. When serfdom was abolished, they became peasants. Peasants, legally, had the right to earn wages. And that's it. 
uh, cities, towns would have a middle class made up of craftsmen and merchants. The king would issue each town their town privileges, which would include the privilege to have a market uh, or to have a town council. But those privileges came from the king, and the king can take them away. If you piss off the king, you lose your privileges. And, of course, your town is probably going to be sacked and burned to the ground, in which case your right to have a market day is the least of your problems. A landowning men had the right to demand labor from their peasants, but they did have to pay them. They had to allow them to keep a part of the harvest. They also had the right to demand military service from their peasants. Lord A gets mad at Lord B. They decide to have a kerfuffle. They both get to demand that their peasants uh, pick up a pike and go fight each other. A nobleman who owned huge parcels of land, they could also demand that kind of tribute from smaller landowners. They could demand payment. They could demand military service. And the king, of course, could demand just about anything he wanted. Now, there were some limits on the king, but only a few. Now, the king had the privilege, the freedom, to also mete out much harder, harsher punishments to people who displeased him or betrayed him. Now, you're a peasant, and you disobey your lord. He might fine you in crops. If he's really angry, he could hang you. You commit treason against the king, though, you're hanged. Cut down while you're still alive, uh, have your intestines drawn out of your body, and then cut into four pieces, and the pieces sent to distant parts of the country as a warning to anybody else who decides to annoy the king. But there again, it depended on your status. That would happen to a peasant, that would happen to a commoner. But if you were a nobleman who'd committed treason, that only behead you. Now, the usual punishment, if you were a regular woman married to a regular man and you committed adultery, they might cut the tip of your nose off. If you're the queen and you commit adultery against the king, technically you could be burned alive. They never actually carried that out. Usually it was just beheading, but that law was on the books. The only restraint on the king was the pope. And after the Reformation, some countries didn't even have that. In that kind of society, when somebody talks about freedom, they want more freedom, they don't mean living outside the system. They mean moving up within it. They mean changing their own status. Which made Native America look like anarchy to Europeans. Now, what is anarchy? Let's... Oops. Uh, so monarchy. Monarchy is what happens when you have a king. That means rule by one. Anarchy means rule by none. Archy, rule, and none. Uh, it means there's nobody in charge. There's no government. There's no governing system. Kind of a, a libertarian sort of paradise thing. Uh, and that's what Europeans thought natives had when they came to the New World. They didn't have, for the most part, didn't have hereditary power, didn't have one king always in charge telling everybody else what to do. They didn't have these very stratified sections of society. And so it looked like there was no government. It looked like there was no law, was no rule, the way Europeans understood it. Now, of course, Native Americans did have governments. They did have rules. Uh, they did have people who were in charge, just not handled the same way. Uh, Christopher Columbus uh, really liked the Indians that he met. He described them as being uh, very friendly and helpful and gentle. But those images were soon overshadowed by much more negative stereotypes. Early European descriptions of Indians were as barbarians, and that really centered on three particular areas. On how they handled religion, how they handled land, how they handled the women. <laughs> 
whatever country a European came from. European newcomers often assumed that Indians didn't have genuine religion, didn't have genuine government. Now, their healers were called witch doctors, their ceremonies were superstition, uh, they worshipped false gods, they believed that the natives uh, weren't really using the land, therefore it's free to take, and they viewed the roles of women and men as being contrary to the laws of the church. Uh, they actually, uh, when they got to uh, to the mainland, what is now the United States, they kind of thought native men were unmasculine because they went off hunting all the time uh, and the wives were doing the farming. See, in Europe, certainly in England at this time, hunting was recreation. It was a leisure activity that was really only enjoyed by the upper classes. Most of the, the good hunting land, the forests, were owned by the king. You want to hunt there, you need to have permission from the king, which you pretty much only get if you're one of his close noble friends. Uh, regular people going out to hunt were usually poaching, because there simply was no other way to do it. So they come over to the New World and they say just every guy is, you know, hopping on and uh, going out to hunt for a week or more. And the wives are back doing the plowing and the planting and all of that stuff. And they're like, making the women do all of the work. Farming is, in Europe, farming is traditionally the man's job. Making the women do the work and you're going off and hunting. What kind of life is this? The colonizers also pretty quickly decided that Indians didn't understand the true meaning of freedom. Early English and French dictionaries for Engl uh, Indian languages had no entries under freedom or liberty. They also had no entries for king or slave or oppression. The Europeans considered Indians barbaric in part because they didn't seem to live under a firm established government. Of course they had governments, but Europeans didn't recognize them as real. In a sense, they were just too free for European comfort. One Italian explorer wrote back home that the Indians he met lived in absolute freedom. That was not a compliment. Others said that it would be better for the Indians to make them slaves so that they could be taught the proper way to live. Now, the European idea of freedom as a privilege, especially one that was tied to land ownership, didn't have much meaning for most Indian societies. Individuals were, were expected to more think for themselves, um, but generally people were judged according to their ability to live up to collective standards. Everybody had to live up to that standard. There was no separate law for different levels of Indian society. It's not, don't beat your wife unless you're the chief. The well-being of the nation was more important than this one person. From the beginning, dreams of freedom inspired and justified English settlement in America. As colonization began, though, freedom was not one single idea that everybody was fighting for. It was a collection of distinct privileges. Many of those privileges were only enjoyed by a small portion of the population. The late 1500s, though, and the 1600s, when England kind of got off its butt and started being able to try to colonize, that was a time of change for them. The old ideas were falling away. Uh, new ideas were taking their place. Some of those new ideas were actually very old, stretching back to ancient Greece. Some of those ideas only lasted for a handful of years. Some of them laid the foundation for our modern concept of human freedom. Now, one of the common definitions of freedom that people understood in the late medieval early renaissance period was Christian freedom. A Christian freedom had nothing to do with social station or politics or rights or anything like that. It was a moral condition. Freedom meant being free of sin and being a servant of God. The Bible, 2 Corinthians, says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, and that's what this was based on. But you think about peasants. That's really the only kind of freedom they could ever expect to get. They had no political freedom. They had no economic freedom. They want freedom 
being free of sin is, is as close as they're going to get to it. Christian freedom had nothing to do with religious freedom or religious toleration. That was unheard of in Europe at this time. Every nation in Europe had an established church. Every nation told you what forms of worship were acceptable there. Dissenters weren't just punished by the church, they could be put to death by the state, uh, the secular government itself. Rulers tended to believe that religious uniformity was necessary um, for public order. If people can start believing what they like about God, ooh, they might start believing what they like about the king and the government. We can't have that. The idea that a, a person's religious beliefs are their own private business instead of a public obligation, that was unheard of at this time. Uh, there were religious wars going on, but those wars were never about the citizen's right to choose his or her religion. Those wars were about the king's right to impose his religion on his subjects. Now, there was a, a deep-seated terror, really, of, of anarchy. So freedom was kept really closely. Any step outside of the ordinary needed to be squashed real quickly. Freedom meant living in the law. It meant knowing your place, knowing your status, obeying your master, whether that's a, a nobleman or a king or the pope. In its secular form, freedom was also about obedience. And that meant that freedom meant obedience to law. It meant nothing about rights. It meant not anarchy. But the rule of law didn't even apply to all people equally. Inequality was built into the fabric of life. Within English families, men exercised complete authority over their wives and children. They had a legal doctrine known as coverture. When a woman married, she ceased to exist legally. Her legal identity was surrendered and became covered by that of her husband. Have you ever met uh, an older lady? Almost always going to be an older lady. Uh, probably looking at somebody maybe in their 80s or 90s now by this point, who calls herself Mrs. John Smith. Doesn't call herself Mrs. Jane Smith. Uh, certainly doesn't call herself Jane Smith. She is Mrs. John Smith. That's because under the doctrine of coverture, which even after it was outlawed, uh, even after the laws were changed socially, it remained very important. There was no such thing as a Mrs. Jane Smith. She was always Mrs. John Smith. Jane Smith simply did not legally exist. You can still sometimes find folks, older folks, uh, who were born after this was outlawed, who were born after all of this changed, but the social custom attached to it was still very strong. Um, a wife did have some protections. She couldn't control her wages, she couldn't own property, she couldn't sign contracts, she couldn't write her own will, but she had some protections. Um, if she was a widow, if her husband died, she got the use of a portion of his estate as long as she lived. But it was not hers, you understand. Once she died, it would go back to his estate to his other heirs. Liberty, again, can't stress this enough came from knowing your place, fulfilling your duty. A well-ordered society depended on obedience. Freedom was a function of social class. Each level of society um, had their own degrees of freedom. And so in this sense, English freedom for a long time remained very, very medieval. Our modern civil liberties, they didn't exist. The law told you what form of religion was acceptable. The government censored publications it didn't like before they were even published. Criticizing the government could land you in prison at best. Uh, there was a smidgen of free speech. If you were a member of the House of Commons uh, in Parliament, while you were standing up giving a speech in the House of Commons, you could say whatever you liked. That was your freedom of speech. You step down from the podium, you leave the House of Commons, you become a private citizen again, no more freedom of speech. Even though people of wealth had a lot more privileges than commoners, 
there were certain rights of Englishmen that applied to all freeborn men in the kingdom. The tradition of the rights of Englishmen comes from a document called the Magna Carta that was signed in the early 1200s, quite a while before the colonial period. He had gotten into a lengthy dispute with his barons. John is the one that they call Bad King John, which if you know anything about uh, the British monarchy, you have to wonder how bad do you have to be to be the one <laughs> that they call Bad King John. Uh, the Magna Carta lists a series of privileges granted by the king to, in their words, all free men of our realm. Now, at the time the Magna Carta was signed, 12, 13-ish, I think, um, there were not many free men. That was still firmly in the days of feudalism. Easily more than half the men in England were serfs. Absolutely not free. But over time, as feudalism slowly died, as more men were seen as free-born men, the Magna Carta came to be seen as the basis of English freedom. There came to be this idea that even the king should be subject to the rule of law. Not all kings liked that idea. Uh, and this idea that all men, regardless of status, have some particular rights. The right to a trial by jury. The right to face your accuser. The, the right not to be fined for a crime that you have not been convicted of. Can you believe they had to write that one down? At the beginning of the 1600s, Freedom still played only a minor role in England's political debates. But there were a series of upheavals, political chaos, frankly, uh, for most of that century, that made the concept of English freedom much more important. What is freedom? Who enjoys it? Where does it come from? Parliament was becoming much more powerful. The House of Commons was becoming more powerful. And as they became more powerful, they insisted more and more that first, Parliament should have a bigger say in what the law was, and second, the king should have to follow the laws. Now the kings at this time, the early 1600s, they did not look favorably on these ideas. They wanted to be absolute rulers, like the rulers of Spain allegedly were. Uh, king James I and his son Charles I a civil war broke out between Parliament and the King. Now, there was also a religious element to this war. Parliament, the House of Commons, uh, was mostly Protestant, and, and actually the, the Civil War faction, the warring faction, was led by kind of hardline Puritans. Charles I, on the other hand, the King, was married to a Catholic woman and was very favorable toward Catholicism himself. In 1659, it all came to a head. Uh, literally, Charles I was beheaded. The monarchy was abolished, and England was declared a commonwealth and a free state, a nation allegedly governed by the will of its people. Now, that only lasted for 11 years. You might notice they have a queen today. That commonwealth didn't last long. The monarchy was restored after 11 years. But just in that period, just in that brief 11-year period, the breakdown of authority had created intense discussions of liberty and authority and what it meant to be a freeborn Englishman. Now, all of these rights, you know, the, the rights of Englishmen, the stuff written down in the Magna Carta, all freeborn Englishmen have this, specifically in the Magna Carta were granted by the king. Now, 1649 there's no king. Do you still have those rights? Do you still have the right to trial by jury? Do you still have the right to face your accuser? If you're in a town, there is no king to grant you town privileges. Can you still have a market day? Can you still have a town council? Can you still do all of these things? All of these privileges were said to come from the king. But there ain't no king. What do you do now? Where does your freedom come from? Where do your privileges come from? Are they maybe not privileges? Are they maybe actually inborn universal rights? As in every revolution, the idea of freedom 
took on new meaning between 1649 and 1660. People started demanding freedom of the press, freedom of speech. There were new religious groups springing up. They demanded religious toleration. One of these groups was the Levellers. They became England's first democratic political movement. They wanted a written down constitution. Everybody's rights, everybody's privileges, all laid out, black and white, on paper, so nobody can mess with it, where everybody would know who had what they, they were allowed to do and have. They wanted more men to be able to vote. Um, some of them went so far as to say that all adult men should be allowed to vote, regardless of how much land they owned. They wanted to abolish the House of Lords. They said there should be no unelected government in this land. Some of them even condemned slavery. Now, the Levellers believed that freedom was a universal entitlement. It's not a privilege that somebody else gives you. You're born, you're born free, you have certain rights. There was another group, even more radical, the Diggers. They also believed that freedom should be equal, but they went further. They wanted to end the idea of private property. They believed that all land should be held equally by the people in common. That would end poverty. Now, these were very small groups. All of the radical groups were pretty small. They never had many followers. People in power absolutely hated them. But they did have an impact on American ideas of freedom. 1649, when the Commonwealth starts, there are already English colonies in the New World. And one of the ways that you get rid of political radicals in the old days, if there are too many to just hang, is you pack them up and ship them off to the colonies. So the English colonies over here got more than our fair share of people like the Levellers and the Diggers and their radical ideas. And it's going to create a, a very different political atmosphere here than in Britain. Alright, so we're done kind of talking about this New Worlds idea. Um, next lecture is going to be about founding those colonies, about the kind of development of those colonies uh, up to eh, Seven Years' War, uh, up to right before the Revolution. And, and then the, the third lecture of this unit will be uh, a war, yeah, fighting a war and starting a new nation and all of those things. Um, or maybe we'll do that in the second unit, yeah, whichever. <laughs>